Welcome to FIRE, the National Newspaper Publishers Association and Black Press of America's daily broadcast. Described as painfully shy and soft-spoken as a child, Denise Woods stood out in New York's Lower East Side. Her father passed away when she was just five, and she and her sister were raised by their hard-working, church-going mother. Denise was surrounded by family, including her aunt, Sylvia Woods, the famed queen of soul food and proprietor of Harlem's legendary Sylvia's Restaurant. In junior high school, Denise sang her way into the company of the New York City Opera. She won New York's Miss Black Teen title, and later she would audition and be accepted into the famed high school of the performing arts, followed by acceptance into the drama division of the Juilliard School. Denise has appeared in several Broadway productions, networks, soap operas, and numerous plays. In her new book, The Power of Voice, Denise writes, I am an African-American woman born and raised in Manhattan's Lower East Side housing projects during the 60s and 70s by a single working mother. But the typecasting ends there. Well, let's find out more from the woman herself, Denise Woods. Welcome, Denise. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was so lovely said. So lovely spoken. Thank you. Well, we're, we're so glad to have you, especially this is a special week for us. It's the NNPA's uh, Midwinter Training Conference uh, and folks can go there. They're going to learn a I whole lot. That. They can go there at virtualnnpa2021.com. But Denise, let's talk about this new book. Let's start there. Um, what was the impetus behind um, The Power of Voice? Excellent question. It was Oprah Winfrey. Oh, well, <laughs> I, know, <there> <laughs> I know people say that. I know people say, oh, well, you know, Oprah inspired me. But no, she really did. I was watching the Golden Globes the year that the Me Too movement came to be. Well, it didn't come to be, but it came on the national platform during the Golden Globes when all of the women, all of the actresses were wearing black. And Oprah gave the keynote speech. And she was moving people left and right. Emotionally, we were crying in our, in our homes, on our couches, in our beds, watching her basically giving women a call to action. Basically saying, I know that there is someone out there who has a story in them. I know that you have the capacity to share your story with the world. And it was that Sunday evening that I said, I have to write my book. And so I got up and I um, called a woman who is a ghostwriter because although I write well, I had the presence of mind to say, you're gonna need help to do this. Yeah. And so I looked for this ghostwriter's name and I couldn't find it and searched high and low and the rest is history because she, I then, I then got in touch with her that night and I, I just wanna extend this a little bit more so you can see how, and the listeners can see how when it's meant to be, it's supposed to be. I mm. called her that night. She got back to me because I had a one pager for a book that I had been sitting on for four years and had reached out to Common's manager when Common first wrote his first book and got her name. I couldn't even find it. And so finally, when I found it, I sent her the one page. She got back to me that night and said, this is amazing. Can I send it to my agent? I said, sure. Her agent gets it. The next day, she reaches back and says, this is amazing. I was at a cocktail party with an agent that is looking for this book. And can I send it to him? And I said, sure. That was Tuesday. Wednesday, he calls me and says, oh, my gosh, I have been looking for this book for 15 years. Wow. I went, by Thursday, I had an agent. And six months later, well, yeah, after we wrote the, the um, proposal, Six months later, I had a book deal with Harper Collins. Wow. Just from that night, that Oprah Winfrey speech moved me to get up and say, I've got something I need to share with the world. And six months later, I had a book deal. Well, naturally, there's no need to uh, uh, pay any like, type of royalties or finance fee to Oprah. I mean, she's pretty, I think she's pretty set, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, she has inspired so many of us. And I am just another one of the plethora of people that have benefited from her graciousness. 
Well, and many have benefited from you. I mean, you've worked Aww. with so many people. And we also know, too, and, and we're going to bring that book cover up because somebody very special is holding that book cover. Um, I think that her name is Halle Berry. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that is one of my best friends. And I can say that unequivocally. A dear friend, she is uh, my spiritual sister. Uh, we worked together on a couple of projects. And then when she was making her directorial debut uh, and her film, which she stars and directed, um, she called to she sought me out to be her coach because the person is from the Bronx and then it moved, the character moved to New Jersey and she wanted this authentic dialect. So we started working on it and then it just got so deep. We just really got into the character and into the nuances of dialect and we became really, really close. And she said, Denise, I know we're working in Los Angeles in prep, but what would it take for you to come with me to New Jersey on set? And I said, just ask. And she did. And I came and we became very good friends. And so she is also in the book. She has also contributed to the book. She, so the book is a compilation of wonderful stories, uh, my, mine included, of people who have gotten over certain things in life, be it trauma or a speech impediment or anything that would, would prohibit them from sharing their voice and, yeah. and, and, and gracing the world with their voices, people have graciously talked about it and Hallie contributed to the book. And so after doing the movie, we got so close. She said, Denise, whatever you need. As a matter of fact, I do this thing on Instagram where I, I highlight books, books in bed with Hallie. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is great. And she said, I would do it for you. And so that's, she does this amazing things where, thing where she re recommends books to people wow. from her bed. Yeah. And, and you mentioned um, those with different challenges. We, um, off air, we talked a little bit about that 22 year old poet, um, Amanda Gorman, who, who gave uh, a phenomenal poem at uh, President Biden's inauguration. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that connects with um, the, the theme of your book? Well, first of all, we were all blown away and inspired by that young woman's poetry, by her light, her gifts. It, I, I can't even imagine what that celebration would have been like without her. Mm -hmm. And so when I started doing more research, I realized that she had overcome a speech impediment. And I thought, this is the perfect example of what my work is about, uh, 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 an example of what my mission is about with this work. And it doesn't have to be a speech impediment. It can be anything in life that is holding us back from putting our true selves into the world, for putting, from putting our true voices into the world, from putting our true essence into the world. Because that young woman, we didn't just hear her poetry. We really felt her essence. And mm -hmm. a lot of times when someone has an impediment, speech impediment or a physical impediment or anything, when we're children, we're, we're ridiculed and we're made fun of. And a lot of times it has a tendency to prevent us from being who we could potentially fully become. And it was so enlightening to see that young girl, that young woman yeah. who did not allow that speech impediment to impede her gift. Because at the end of the day, we all have gifts. And it's incumbent upon us to share them with the world. And that's what that young woman did. She shared her gift with us. And um, as I said, I, I can't even imagine what that would have been and what the world would be if we didn't have Amanda Gorman's voice because her shame or her embarrassment because she couldn't make the sound er, r would right. hold, was holding her back. You know, the, the fact that she did something about it is the key. Yeah. And and can you just perhaps expand just a little bit uh, without giving everything away, of course, on perhaps a challenge you had um, and, and, and how it's brought out in the book? I had 
been diagnosed as many of us from time to time, we get hit with a health diagnosis. And, um, and, and sometimes it can floor us. Sometimes it can stifle us. Sometimes it can stop us. And sometimes we internalize it through no fault of our own. A health diagnosis is, as I said, through no fault of our own. But sometimes we internalize it and we have a tendency to incorporate shame around um, a lot of things oh, that really don't is. have anything to do with us. Not just a health diagnosis, but but trauma, traumatic events that happen to people uh, um, coming up as children. We have a tendency to let it silence us and silence our voices. And part of this book is not just how to or the stories of, it really is an effort to empower people to take off those shackles the, the psychological shackles, the emotional shackles, so that we can breathe. <laughs> because I say breath is to voice what gasoline is to a car. But when you are sitting on a secret or you're sitting on something shameful, it prohibits you from going deeply into the breath. Because when you breathe deeply, that's when you start going into your emotional well. And when you're sitting on something that you're embarrassed about or shameful of, you don't want to go there. You don't want to experience those feelings. And so therefore, you keep your breathing shallow. You keep the mask on for the world to see. And what I am imploring people is to take the mask off, to breathe deeply, to go there and let the world see your authentic light, to let the world hear your authentic voice. And the only way to do that is to go there. Yeah. And so then there, there it is, right? The power of voice, right? Absolutely. And, and as you, as you mentioned, so many are, you know, you face certain challenges, whether it's health or something else, and, and you tend to, in, in some cases, lose your voice. You, you, you tend to not want to speak out or, or say anything. Um, so again, your book, The Power of Voice, I would imagine uh, there are probably uh, many antidotes in there that that really bring out um, the importance of the power of, of voice. There are there are several there are, there are several anecdotes by broadcast journalists. Uh, I don't want to name them because I want people <laughs> to buy the book and go, oh my God, she's in the book too. Well, we know uh, Halle Berry's in the book. <laughs> we know Halle's in the book, but I have I have professional athletes. I have. CEO, I have an African-American CEO of a company who talks about his voice and, and, and what that was as an African-American male in a Fortune 500 company and what the board members were saying about his voice that was really tinged in racial overtones. Um, oh, we, we go in and I have everyday people. But, but what the, the, the basis of this is, is freeing your voice, allowing you to, to have a platform, be it a platform in your home with your friends or on, on, on a national stage to be able to go deep inside of who you are so that you can speak your truth. I give exercises as well. I don't just say, oh, these are stories of people who did it, who got it. You know, I show you how to get it too. And, and that's the, that's the beauty of it. I knew for years that I didn't want to make a rehash of the, 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 the books that I had read when I was at Juilliard. And when I say the books that I had read, because I was a student at Juilliard in the 70s, I was in Keith David's class. Um, I was two, we were two years behind Robin Williams at Juilliard. And I just didn't want to make a remake of the books that we were studying because they were really from a Eurocentric paradigm. They were based on white America's notion of how a person should speak and sound. And I said, I can't do that. I have to come in and, 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 and create a text to reflect all of America. I said, we don't, we don't all look alike. Why should we all sound alike? That's well, what I want to know. There you go. And, and the complete title of the book, um, for, for everyone's reference, is The Power of Voice, A Guide to Making Yourself Heard. And it's uh, published by HarperCollins, 
Harper One and Harper Collins. And it's available what everywhere, Amazon.com, uh, Harper Collins um, website. Uh, so it's it's really um, a book that you should you should all get. Success, um, Denise, is relative, but so many people only measure it in terms of goals that will never be achieved by the average person. Do you think it's important for us to learn how to measure and appreciate uh, everyday successes? Absolutely. Everyday successes are, are, are just as, if not more, important than the big long-term goals. I often say, if I can lay my head on the pillow at night and be okay with what I was able to do today, then it's a job well done. That's a success. That's the success. And so what I have found that to be, that daily success is giving of myself. What makes me feel good at the end of the day when I lie the head on the pillow is the fact that I have given of myself. And it doesn't have to be given of my purse. It's given, given, I've given someone a sense of who I am. And I talk about this as it relates to the voice. I say that your voice is a gift. I want you to think of your voice like that little blue Tiffany box. You know that tiff, that blue box that comes with a big white bow tied on it? We know that the quality of that gift that's inside that blue box is going to be quite stellar. I liken the voice to that Tiffany box because that's your gift. That's your gift to the world. And so that's, that's how you quantify success, how much you've given of yourself to the world, your voice, your essence, your spirit. That's the real success. And, and you know, uh, for, for those who don't know, I should say, um, Denise was the first African-American woman asked to join Juilliard's acting company and the first uh, African, African-American to join the drama division faculty at Juilliard. What was that like at that <laughs> point in time? It was groundbreaking. And I don't use that term lightly. It was groundbreaking. It was um, the vision of the head of the drama division at the time. His name is Michael Kahn. He was my third year acting teacher when I was there at Juilliard in the 70s. And then he headed the drama division in the 90s. And he looked around and said, okay, we have no black people on this faculty. What's wrong with that? And in one year, you know, I mean, it, 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 we still have a long way to go. And I say we because Juilliard is my home. It really, really is. I grew up there and I've given a lot and they've given a lot to me. And the institution has a long way to come in terms of a long way to go in terms of equity. But I think their intentions are pure. It was tough. It was it, we were there. Keith and I were there at a, at a time when things were just beginning, beginning to change in the curriculum. And then I came back and taught in the 90s when things were really changing because mm -hmm. the African-American students weren't having it. They were coming in, they were so woke and they weren't having it. They just weren't having what we kind of sort of took as well, that's the status quo. We're at Juilliard. We're here to get the we're here to get the education. We're here to get the tools and then we can take them and 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 take them and do what we will with them once we graduate. But those students in the 90s came in and said, mm -mm, you're gonna treat me with respect while I'm here too. We're not gonna wait till we graduate. <laughs> you're gonna treat me with respect. And then these current students now are not saying you're not gonna just treat me with respect but you're going to put more, I'm going to see myself in the curriculum. I'm going to see myself more on the faculty and I'm gonna see myself in the curriculum. And, um, and, and it's evolving and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. Yeah, it's a privilege. We're talking with Denise Woods, the author of The Power of Voice. Denise, you start the book off by writing, um, as we said at the top of the show, I am an African-American woman born and raised in Manhattan's Lower East Side housing projects during the 60s and 70s by a single working mother. Now, here's the interesting thing. You said, but the typecasting ends there. Can you um, expand upon, upon that a little bit? I am also well-traveled. 
I am also uh, a, 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 a person of very strong faith. I'm, I'm, I'm a mother of a beautiful African-American man. And, and part of, of that, that narrative is that I don't want to be seen and I don't want us to be seen as a monolith. You know, we are so wonderfully different. We are so complex. I know that the Caribbean students at Juilliard, um, when when I was there as an actor, you know, we're all just clumped into one, you know? Oh, you're black, you're black. Well, I'm from Jamaica, you know, I'm from Trinidad. I'm, my people are from South Carolina, you know? And that's, when, that's what I wanted to convey that the typecasts, the typecasting stops there because I am these, I'm multifaceted, multi-layered, and I want us to be seen as such because our voices should reflect that. We shouldn't, it's like gumbo. I tell people, you don't, you don't just have one, one, one seasoning in, in, a, in gumbo. It's all of those seasonings to give it the flavor that, that make up the stew, that make up the gumbo. That, that's what I'm talking about. All of my experiences, I'm the sum total of my experiences. You know, I'm a wife, I'm, I'm a mother, I, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm a mentor. And so I want to, I want all of those embraced. Yeah, and mm. I want to say um, hello to Hiram Murray, uh, Ian's Jeanette, uh, Theo, um, I can't pronounce your last name, Theo Ogun Yoda. Oh, Theo Ogun Yoda. And Hiram and Jeanette. <laughs> hello, everybody. Thank you for watching. Yeah, we, we, uh, we appreciate That's family. They're family and students. It's family well, and students. Yeah. And speaking of family, um, and, and as we said at the very top, um, and her, her uh, first of all, everyone should read Denise's bio when you get a chance. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we don't have, there's not enough time. Uh, in the day, let alone this broadcast, to cover that great bio of her. She, I have been lives, she lived, I mean, she's really lived quite quite the life. But um, speaking of family, um, you know, black people like to eat. Where, where, where do black people like to eat most in Harlem? Sylvia's. Black people like to eat at Sylvia's. Yeah, Sylvia's yeah. restaurant. Sylvia Woods is my aunt Sylvia from the famous soul food restaurant. But I also have a cousin Melba who also owns a restaurant in Harlem. So I come from a wonderful line of entrepreneurs. And so I think it was my artistry, my faith, coupled with my entrepreneurial spirit that got me here and my mom. I'm not going to leave her out. My mama. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and you know, I talk about her in the book. She wasn't having it. She wasn't playing. We grew up in the projects, but we were not of a project mentality. And as, as were most of the kids that I grew up with, our mothers and fathers were very present in our lives. And so, and we grew up in the projects in the 50s, and it was a whole different landscape then. Um, but we grew up in, in, in really staunch middle class, albeit lower middle class, black families that wanted the best for their children. And so I come from a really long line of, of amazing black women and men. My father graduated from an HBCU. He's <laughs> Omega, he's you he's two, you know, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. Yeah, and, and um, as, as you said, uh, back then, especially, there was this community responsibility, right? Everybody Absolutely. in the family was responsible for everybody in the family. And this, and, and we asked this question earlier, but it goes back to that question again about um, measuring success, right? It does go back. I mean, how do you quantify it? How do you measure it? As I said, I, I measure it in small doses and I don't use anybody else's litmus stick. You know, I don't use it. it I don't use your set of of rules for what what success is for me because I have had money and I have had no money. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, I have been happy when I had no money. I, and, and clearly I have been unhappy when I've had no money. But <laughs> I have been happy when I have had no money because money doesn't create the circumstances you do, the people you love, the people you're around, the art you create. 
you know? So I implore people to, to find their voices, not just the, 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 the physical embodiment, embodiment of your voice, but to find your voice in what it is that you do so that that really, really defines success for you. What you put into the world, the art you put into the world, the science that you put into the world, the you that you put into the world, that's success. Yeah. And the love that you give to the world and get from the world, you know, that reciprocal love thing. Because I am so loved. Yesterday was um, the release of my book. And I was so loved on yesterday by so many people. And someone asked me, Denise, how do you feel? I said, I really haven't felt like this since my wedding day. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And that was, that was almost 40 years ago. Well, <laughs> that was about 35 years ago. It was 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. I have not felt like I felt yesterday, everybody, in 30 five years wow. in 30 a lot and, and 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 i'm not talking about happy or joyful i felt so many emotions i'm talking about pure love loved on appreciated i slept well last night it was like oh <laughs> <laughs> denise you also founded the uh something called speak it clearly can you Absolutely. tell us a little bit about that? I know we, we are um, coming up against it, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Speak It Clearly was my effort when I retired from higher ed. So I taught at Juilliard in the 90s, and I taught at a place called California Institute of the Arts it, from 2000 to 2012. And, um, and, I, and I, I taught there for 12 years, retired so that I could give more of my time to my private, my private industry, my private um, coaching, my private clients that led me to Hollywood. And it was then that I started, well, I had always been doing movies and coaching, but I really um, centered on Hollywood and went after it. And then it was early on um, that I realized that I had to get out of Hollywood. I couldn't just stay in Hollywood. I had to take this that I was giving to actors to, to, to create these phenomenal characters. I had to give it to everyday people. I had to be of service. I had to, to, to do something for community. And, 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 and a, lot, a lot of times I, I would give my lessons free. And, um, and because I remember telling a young woman, I, she said, Denise, I can't afford you. And I said, sweetheart, you can't afford not to have me. So I'm going to give you these lessons for free. And she was blown away. And the blessings that have come triple fold. I can't, that's a whole nother broadcast. I want to tell you <laughs> the, the, the blessing of giving your voice and giving, giving, giving. You must because it will come back. And that's where Speak It Clearly was born because I want everybody to have options. I'm not saying you have to sound this way. You've got to sound that way. You just want options. You don't have the same suit. You don't have the right. same pair of shoes. I wouldn't wear a pair of jeans on the red carpet. I have <laughs> choices. And so that's what I want to people to have is vocal choices. Where are you going to put that on? How, you know, I just did it. I did an interview before and I didn't have this jacket on. I did an interview a half hour ago and I thought, no, I think I'm going to put this jacket on for this one for my brothers, you know? <laughs> and it's the same thing with your speech and your voice. You've got choices. It's like the difference between having a box of eight crayons and having a box of 64. Now with 64 crayons, you got five shades of green. Yeah. You've got four shades of blue. You have different shades and nuances that you can experiment with your voice. Yeah, wow. Well, we're gonna bring that book up, up again because Thank what a way to show it with Halle Berry, right? The Power of Voice, a, a Guide to Making Yourself Heard by uh, Denise Woods. Before we let you go, we got to ask you, um, there's so much more we could cover. We, we got to have you back. We certainly got to have you back. But I'll be back. What, great. Well, what does the future hold for Denise Woods? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a producer now. <laughs> I'm producing movies. I'm producing movies because 
I want us to be able to tell our stories. And I have been on movie sets, and I'm gonna just say this, I've been on movie sets where we thought they were black movies, they were not black movies, they were white movies about black people. And as a result, the narrative gets a little skewed. You know, you go, what? Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't have done that. I know they wouldn't have done that because if there had been black producers on the film, we would have said, you know, we don't do that. Or that's not what we would have done in that situation. So I took it upon myself to gather some people in very high places who I have taught <laughs> and who yeah. I have worked with and said, can I come in and, and play with you guys? And they welcomed me in. And so I've got a couple of film projects that I'm working on as a producer. Oh, you definitely yeah. have to come back and tell us all about that for sure. Yeah, uh, we, I have to we're counting on you, Denise Woods. Yes. We are definitely <laughs> counting on you. And everybody stay tuned because um, we have this afternoon, Lisa Yarrow, um, a fantastic act actress at three o'clock today. Uh, she's also a Grammy nominated singer. She'll be joining us. This is a special week for the Black Press. Um, our Midwinter Training Conference is taking place this week, www.virtualnpa2021.com. You can register, it's free. Stephanie Mills is gonna perform uh, during the conference mm. as well. So, so check it out. You don't wanna miss Stephanie and you don't wanna miss buying Denise's, Denise Wood's book, The Power of Voice. A guide to making yourself heard. And Denise, continue. It's available succession. on Amazon. It's available and, on Amazon. Amazon. And I have the audiobook version on Audible. All right. Well, who yes. did the audio? Can, can you tell us who did the audio? I did. Oh, there you go. I did. I had to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Since you know all these famous people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag about one thing. So years okay. ago... Years ago, I, I teamed up and did a book with Stevie Wonder's mother um, oh, called wow. Blind Faith, The Miraculous Journey of Stevie uh, Stevie Wonder and His Mother, Lula Hardaway. And you know who did our audio? Who? None other than Viola Davis. So so there you go, Denise. So you well, she was my student at Juilliard. Oh, well, there, see? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody stay safe. We're in mass social distance. Wash your hands, 20 seconds or more at least, and we will see you at 3 o'clock. Denise Woods, thank you so much. Thank you all. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye-bye.